Welcome to our journey from London to Edinburgh on one of British Rail's high-speed trains, the HST 125. It's called 125 because at times it'll be travelling at a comfortable 125 miles an hour. That's over 191 kilometres an hour. Before we start, we'd better find out what time trains leave King's Cross. Let's catch one which stops at Doncaster and York, because there are one or two people I'd like you to meet there. So first of all, let's make a telephone call to King's Cross Travel Centre. This is British Rail's talking timetable, giving details of the principal scheduled intercity services to York from King's Cross on Mondays to Fridays. Until I think we should catch the 11 o'clock, because that'll give us time to talk to some of the people behind the scenes at King's Cross before we leave. Of course, a lot of the railway people who work at King's Cross are only there at night time, when the mail and newspapers are being put on the trains and the sleeping cars are getting ready to leave. With over 300 trains arriving and departing from its two miles of platforms, King's Cross is always a busy place. Some 2,000 people work here, including Tony Swift, who's the passenger assistant responsible for our train to Edinburgh. My involvement with the 125 train... It's a very lengthy one, a lot of the involvement before you even see the train in King's Cross Station, because my responsibilities include the planning of the timetable, which has all been done many months before, but more importantly, during last night the train has been down at the depot at Barnes Green, where it's been maintained and where it's been cleaned from top to bottom and outside through an automatic washer. And all that work comes under my realm of authority. Time's getting on, so we should go over to the travel centre to get our tickets. In the days of the stagecoach, when it took about 13 days to reach Edinburgh, this journey would have cost you a man's wage for a whole year. Let's cheat a bit. and Instead of joining other passengers in the ticket queue, let's go behind the counter at the travel centre. The travel centre at King's Cross not only sells the tickets, but also answers all the inquiries too, either directly or by telephone. One of the important questions to ask before buying a ticket is what kind of ticket is best for me today, for my particular journey? A day return? A single? Or what? Mr Stigwood, who's in charge of the centre, showed me the new ticket machines, looking very much like cash registers in a supermarket. With these machines you can punch in any information regarding all the fares on offer from King's Cross on the East Coast Main Line to Edinburgh uh, by pressing the various buttons, inserting the amount of cash for which we are asking you for the ticket we're selling, and then at the press of another button this will print it on the special ticket and it is all recorded for computer analysis of British Rail. You talk about cash, but I see some people are signing with credit cards here. But I suppose you do take an enormous amount of cash here. How much would come through? The, the cash uh, in total is about three quarters of a million for a, four, a normal four weeks, give or take the holiday seasons. Quite a lot of cash, that. Over a thousand pounds an hour. David Ayres, a travelling ticket inspector, who will be coming with us as far as Doncaster, will collect our tickets on the train. How many different kinds of tickets does he have to recognise and remember? It runs into hundreds. We usually start from the rear of the train and work towards the front, so we cover every passenger. I see. Keeping an eye out for anybody who's trying to dodge past to that ticket. Exactly, yes. I expect you get to know all the tricks, do you? We do, yes. This comes with experience. As you come up, you clip all the tickets. That's right. And you've got a special clipper with you. Can you tell us something yeah. about this? Well, it's a distinctive mark used by travelling ticket inspectors according to the region on which they work. Uh, we have two distinctive marks. Well, this is what we call an anchor nip. Let me show the, uh, any dispute with the ticket would show that that ticket had been nipped uh, by a travelling ticket inspector from King's Cross. I could tell you where you'd actually join the train if a ticket had been examined en route and where you left the train, which barrier you actually passed through. Now it's time for us to get on board. The indicator says our train leaves from platform two, and we've only got a few minutes. As soon as we're on board and the train is ready to leave, what will happen is this. The guard, who we will meet a little later on, 
will have checked the train, made his brake tests, and finished his station duties. He'll then make sure that all the doors are closed, and press a buzzer, which is in his guard's brake. He'll give two buzzes, which will tell the driver that the train is ready to go. The driver will then answer the guard with two buzzes to say, Yes, I've heard you, and gradually he'll begin to open the throttle to start our huge train on its way. We're very lucky indeed because we're going to be allowed to go up onto the footplate of this train to see exactly how it's driven. Our guide is an expert driver, footplate inspector Clem Britton. The throttle is the one on the right, and um, as you can see it's marked off in four stages, one, two, three and four, and then full. And when we start away, of course, we just start away in notch one so that we start away very, very smoothly. We don't want to upset anybody, especially if people are walking through the train trying to find a seat, so we throw them about. We just gradually accelerate away, and as we get out, so we accelerate up. We, we can accelerate very, very quickly on, the, on these. You've got to remember we've got two 2,000... 500 horsepower locomotives, one at the front pulling and one at the back pushing. And our eight coaches we've got in between, so of course we've really got a double double unit, as we call it, here to, to be able to give us the acceleration that we want. As you can see, we've now, the little time we've been talking, we're now up to 80. We won't hit 125 at this part because we are restricted, but once we get outside, the driver will be able to open up and we'll be away. Now in the background, well there's one at the moment, one of those bells. What are the bells? Well, mean? that tells the driver that the next signal and the next signal are clear or off. Now if they are not clear or off, we won't get a bell, and this time we'll get a horn. And if the driver doesn't take the appropriate, the appropriate action, i.e. he must press that button that's beside the controller, he's got to press that button within 40 seconds, and if he doesn't do it, we will get an emergency brake application. I promised you that we'd meet the guard of our train later on, so now let's find our way back to the end of the train where Mr Smith Chapel is sitting in his guard's brake waiting for us. As we walk back down the train, notice how the doors in between the air-conditioned carriages all open automatically as we approach them. I wonder if Mr Chapel has to deal with many emergencies in his job. Not a lot, but you're there in case these things do happen, and uh, it's knowing what to do when they do happen that uh, makes the job that you've got to be on your toes a little bit. So God really is a... a guard to the passengers. He's, uh, he's looking after the passengers all the time that we're travelling and whatever their requirement is, whether it be uh, wanting to know where to change or uh, wanting to know where the toilets are or uh, whatever they want, we've got to be trying to be ready with an answer. Our train is full of passengers. Where have all these people come from? Where are they going? And why are they on our train? We're from the United States, Boston, Massachusetts. We're on holiday. We don't have trains like this in the United States, and that's why we decided to come by train instead of by air. I'm from London. I'm traveling to Edinburgh on business. Do you often travel by train? Thousands and thousands of miles a year on the train, probably. How often did you come to Edinburgh? I've been twice now within the last three weeks. And you can have a meal on the train as well, are you? Uh, no, I won't. I try to diet, so I, <laughs> I keep chocolate and things like that by, by me. But I quite often do eat on the train. Breakfast uh, I often have from travelling early, of course, dinner coming home at night. You prefer to travelling in the car, do you? For long distances, yes. The, the intercity runs um, things like uh, London to Manchester, London, Liverpool and anything further than that, then the intercities are great. We wanted to see some of the countryside in Scotland. We've heard it's very beautiful, and we're really looking forward to it. Then you'll be eating a meal on the train on the way up. Do you recommend it? <laughs> I don't know yet. Well, that reminds me, I'm feeling quite hungry. Shall we go and find something to eat? There's a buffet car on the train if you just want a snack, 
or a restaurant car if you want a full meal. By the way, I'm told that at King's Cross alone they load 561,000 eggs onto these trains every year, 37,000 pounds of mushrooms, 109,000 pork pies, and 375,000 packets of crisps. In the rather crammed kitchen or galley of the restaurant car, I've been talking to Chef Malcolm Oliphant and Chief Steward Alf Gibbs. Are the menus here always exactly the same? No, certainly not. The menu varies. We have about four or five different menus. It changes every week on a Wednesday. One week it may be chicken, uh, grilled fish. Next week it may be steak and kidney pie and a poached fish with, say, a duclair sauce. And the following week it may be salmon. or About four different types of menus on this train. What is this fish here in trays? This is fillet of place. Everything is just here. It looks fresh and it is fresh. I see there's some other place here which haven't been filleted, also fresh. Yes. You're, you're what, in the business of filleting those now? We will be filleting now, ready for dinner this evening, around about six o'clock, half six. So you have to do all the washing up here too? Oh, yes, yes, yes. yes. Nobody does the washing up but us. <laughs> As we sit eating our meal, the countryside rushes past the windows. Every now and then, we overtake a slower train. It must take a lot of planning to make sure that the trains don't clash, bump into the backs of each other. As Tony Swift told us, the timetables are planned months ahead. To make up the timetables, the timing clerks use sheets of graph paper to make up their charts. The names of the stations are written down the side of the graph, and the time, in minutes, is plotted horizontally, so a 125 train makes a steep line across the page, while a slower freight train plods across the paper at quite a shallow angle. Slow trains and fast trains are controlled by signals. You will have noticed some of them as we've been flying along. To see how they're controlled, let's jump off the train, so to speak, and visit one of the signal boxes ahead of us near North Allerton. David Atkinson has been a signalman for 42 years, and he's sitting in front of a panel with a map of his stretch of line printed on it, about 14 miles, or 23 kilometres in all. All the signals and points are controlled automatically and at the press of a button. In the old days, it could be heavy work, pulling a lever with half a mile of cable attached to it. Every signal on his block is marked with a little light. Most of them are at green, but there are one or two red ones too. And there's a row of silvery buttons for punching out messages to other signal boxes along the way. Mr Atkinson is in constant touch with the signal boxes next to him along the line. One of them rings a bell either Pilmore or North Allerton. It indicates that he's going to give me a train. Have you done it? That's AP, just passing Pilmore. Express passenger train. That, that's what he's coming. And there, is, if you got that ticking noise, mm. that was where he came over a hot axle box detector. Now, if it had a hot axle on, we'd have got a, a burring sound on that machine there, and it also indicates how many wheels it has. And if any one of those wheels had been inclined to be getting warm, this machine would have picked it up and I'd have got a real burring sound on there to say which it was and which, which side of the train it was at. And you would have stopped? We'd have had, him to, had the train to stop and they would have had it to examine before they went any further. And uh, now that he's coming down to me now, I'm going to give him to North Allerton. And there he's passing, and as far as I'm concerned, I'm finished with that train now. It's hard to believe, but at 125 miles an hour, we're already getting close to Doncaster, 156 miles, or 251 kilometres, from King's Cross. As we slow down, look out of the window to the left, and you'll see a big sign saying British Rail Engineering. The works, covering 80 acres, is where most of the repairs for British Rail's eastern region are carried out and where they actually build a lot of locomotives too. Let's have a look inside these workshops as we pass. In the new loco build shop, they are building some big diesel locos. I asked charge hand Dennis Branton if the new locos could be driven straight out of the shop under their own power. No, no, no. Why? Not till it's done its test. And after that, then it is uh, 
can go on its own steam, as it were, yes. That's an that's enormous looking thing, but how long would it have taken you to have built this? I should say 10, 12 week turnaround. That's incredible. And this will be, uh, should give us a ratio of about 25 load turns for a year. Uh, in this shed, I think, in the old days, this is where they built all the old steam. This is where they built all the old steam locals, yes, the V2s and the uh, Pacifics and streamliners and all that, yes. But you don't build the big uh, new 125s, which we've been talking about? No, 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 not those, no. They're built at Derby. Time to get back into our 125. Next stop, York. York is interesting for all sorts of historical reasons, but it is particularly interesting for railway historians because it's the home of the National Railway Museum. It was there that I met the museum's education officer, David Jenkinson, who talked about some of the things you can see. We've got a model of the 125 unit in one of the showcases, and we even have the original experimental advanced passenger train, which is the next generation to follow. We, we see this museum not as a, a museum of railway history that ended years ago, but to show that the railway is an ongoing sort of uh, form of transport, and we're just as interested in what's happening today as what happened 50, 100 years ago. Now, to get down to details, we've been visiting uh, one of the restaurant cars and talking to the chef and the stewards, and we've seen how meals are served on the new 125. To find out about how meals were served in the old days, would one be able to do that here? Yes, indeed. We have a selection of catering vehicles dating back from a dining car built in 1900 uh, right through to modern catering vehicles, or fairly modern ones, in the form of a, a griddle car built in 1960 and two of the very last Pullmans to run on the eastern region. And if I wanted to get an instant history of railways from the beginning, could I do that? Yes. On the balcony, where we are actually standing at the moment, we've tried to portray the history of railways so that a visitor can get some idea of how the whole thing developed over a period of several hundred years. I didn't want to rush you away from the museum, which really takes a whole day to look round, but our 125 is ready to leave York on its way to Newcastle. So let's get back to the station. Well, that's certainly our train leaving York, but not far up the line we have to come to a stop because of a red signal light. What's happened? Harry, our number two driver, climbs down from his cab and goes to a telephone which is fixed on the red signal. Apparently there's an obstruction on the main line a few miles ahead. Harry gets back into the cab and calls up Mr Chapel, our guard, on the train's radio telephone. Hello. Well, I've just, just been informed by the signalman that... Uh... They won't allow us over it. So uh, I think we'll have to set back to Kilmore when, when we've told, been told by the signalman. Over. In a few minutes, telephone instructions tell us that we must go back up the line in order to be switched to the slow line to bypass the obstruction. As I found out later, this was just the sort of problem that the busy regional control office at York is expected to deal with if an incident occurs anywhere between King's Cross and the Scottish border. About a dozen men were sitting at rows of telephones in Deputy Regional Controller Harry Mashford's office. He already knew all about our delay, and he told me what he had had to do about it. The problem we're faced with is, have we a route which, in effect, we can get through uh, by an alternative line? In this case, yes, we had. But unfortunately, your train at the time got to a point of no return where we had to set you back to enable you to take the slow line of route. It did, in effect, delay trains behind you uh, to the extent of 30 minutes. I see, and then once you got that lot so sorted out, then everything was back to normal yes, again. Yes, everything you... went back to normal. Meanwhile, back on our train, which is now beginning to slow down, Mr Chapel, the guard, is getting ready to make an announcement over the train's loudspeaker system. We are arriving at Newcastle. Passengers... For Sunderland, Carlisle, Morford and Hexham, please change at Newcastle. As we crawl into Newcastle over the King Edward Bridge, out of the window I can see a great maze of railway lines, seven tracks all converging into ten different platforms. This must all need a great deal of maintenance, so I've arranged for us to get out of the train, put on bright orange high-visibility jackets, and go on a short tour of inspection with a permanent way inspector, Mr Penny. Every day, of every month, of every year, every mile of track from London to Scotland is inspected on foot. 
I asked him how long a piece of rail would last in service here. It depends on which part of the layout is lying, of course. Here we have traffic coming in more than one direction, and each particular piece of steelwork which forms a crossing gets a severe battering in two directions, whereas a piece of rail, straight rail, or plain rail, only has it on one direction. If we took, for instance, this bit of rail which is just down by my right foot here, how often would that have to be replaced? 10 to 15 years. And the wooden sleepers underneath? Round about the same. And then underneath that is the ballast. The ballast should be changed more frequently than that because, as you see, oil from passing diesels, coal spillage, pollutes the ballast very quickly. So this could be in a four, five-year cycle. But you can take out a lump of this rail just like a bit of Meccano. We can. Or you can replace it like for like. As that train passed, I saw the sleepers heaving up and down. One can see the, the sort of wear that they must get. Yes. These... How many men would you have here working constantly on the rails? There is a gang here of eight men which look after this every day. But to do the actual removing and replacement, we'd need a special gang of 12 to 16 men on a particular weekend. Newcastle is our last stop in England. Soon our 125 train will be racing across the Scottish border at Berwick-upon-Tweed and well on its way to Edinburgh. We'll be coming to the end of our journey to the capital of Scotland. For our final approach into Waverley Station, Edinburgh, let's join Clem Britton back on the footplate. Uh, the driver has started to uh, break down and bring the speed of the train down from the high speed that he was at and, of course, we want to bring it down smoothly and gently so that we don't upset the people that are in the train. He's just going to cancel out because there we are, he's just cancelled out a, a, the, the horn to prevent the brake being applied. Gently bringing it down now to, well, we're about 25 mile an hour we're doing now. And of course, it's a great skill in, in bringing this train to a stand smoothly and gently. As we can see, here we are. We've just we're now we're just approaching the station, and you can see in one of the other platforms we've got one of the diesel multiple units that's probably a book connection for this train. And if you look in the, on the other platforms, you'll possibly see other trains waiting to go to different parts of the country with the passengers that want to change here and get on the the, the, the train. Now here we are. We can see the. All the people Call waiting. All the people waiting to right. bring it. We'll bring a train to the stand right at the end here. Look, can you see at the end of the I platform right where there will be a marker for him to to stop at? There, waiting to meet us on the platform, is Mr. Mackenzie, the station manager, or as he's called today, the area manager. With three miles of platform, covering 23 acres and employing some 800 people, Waverley Station is one of the largest in the country. Yes, it is indeed one of the largest in the country, and it was opened over 100 years ago, in 1842, in fact as the Edinburgh terminus of the Edinburgh and Glasgow Railway. 1842 was in the very early days of railways, of course. We're going to spend one or two days in Edinburgh, but after we've looked around Edinburgh and spent our time there, I think we might like to travel elsewhere. What are some of the places we can go to from this station? Well, I would recommend a trip through to Glasgow through our fast intercity service, a three-quarter of an hour journey. And Glasgow, of course, is the centre of Ayrshire, which is the home country of our famous poet, Rabbi Burns. It's also the centre for the beautiful scenery on the River Clyde, and of course the famous Loch Lomond. But we haven't seen Edinburgh yet. We could stay at one of the two British Rail hotels in the city, either the Caledonian or the North British, both on Princes Street. The head hall porter at the North British is Mr. Petrie, and he suggested that we ought to make a tour on foot to see Edinburgh Castle, and then take a walk down the Royal Mile to see St. Giles Cathedral and the old Scottish Parliament building, and then on to Holyrood Palace, the Queen's official residence when she's in Scotland. And finally, 
Could we hear the sound of bagpipes? On Wednesday nights and Saturday night, there's a beating retreat at the castle at 8 o'clock, last till about 8.45, the ceremony of beating retreat by different regiments of the Highland Brigade. Most days, certainly during the summer, there's a piper on duty at the Scott Monument at 10.45 in the morning. During the festival, of course, the pipes and drums of the pipers taking part in the murder tattoo march along Prince Street every morning at 11 o'clock.